Well, hello everybody. I speak to you today in the name of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, here we are, friends, back at the beginning. Well, of a, of a sort. We are in the season of Advent, which is commonly thought of as a time of preparation for that great celebration of the Incarnation, of Christmas. And while that's true, it is also true that Advent is a time of preparation for that whole cycle of celebrations and of observances that flows forth and, and follows Christmas. So, in a way, Advent is an opportunity in the stress and in the hurry of December well, to, to pause and to reset ourselves, uh, to ground ourselves and to take stock of where we're at before we start off again on another year of human living in relationship to the God who leads us ever onwards. And that's part of why in Advent we find that our readings and our rituals highlight uh, elements of life and, and, and elements of, of faith that are, well, pretty fundamental. One particular focus that we see highlighted is the interplay between two really key aspects of our human experience. On the one hand, there is the imperfection that is suffered in creation and, and of the longing for healing, for wholeness, or for salvation that, that this brings sort of the, the waiting in Advent, if you will. While on the other, there is the promise and the blessedness that is inherent in creation, and how our observation, our celebration of these things, bring us nearer to the presence, the person, the activity of our Maker. So, the promise of Advent. Among other things, then, Advent is a time just to stop for a little bit and to gather ourselves again, and maybe even to ponder what we, as followers of Jesus, find the experience of life, human life, to be. Life in a world where the kingdom of God is at hand and shows itself in bits and in pieces, but while at the same time the damages of our existence and of our circumstances are there too, and, and they wait, just like we still wait, for the fullest resolution to come, to take effect. And all of this brings us to our reading today from the book of the prophet Isaiah, where in the clash between these two things, there is something for us to learn about the opportunity that is there for us as we celebrate this season of Advent. So let's dig in. Well, our reading today begins on a note of power and of glory and of hope in the face of disaster, of pain, of exile, because that's where the people of God are at this point. Their homeland has been conquered brutally, and large portions of the leading peoples have been led off by force to distant lands. So many things that marked these people as God's own, so many parts of what it meant for them to live the lives that they were living, have been taken away from them, have been stripped away by something so much bigger than they are. And in the midst of their captivity and of their humiliation, they've reached the conclusion that, well, they are at least partly responsible for the whole thing. So, on top of everything, they also bear the shame of what they understand to be their total failure in the eyes of God. They are, as one commentator puts it pretty excellently, a grieving and a futureless people. 
But into that way of looking at things comes a voice of consolation, a voice of power, and a voice of mercy. Comfort. Oh, comfort my people, says your God. And then a word of hope that the penalty for the sins of, of the people is paid, and, and it's paid in full. And more, a compelling vision of, of, of renewal, of transformation, the, this deathly wilderness wherein the people are, are trapped becomes transformed uh, into a broad, into an accessible uh, gathering place where all the people will be brought, and they will stand together with their God. Now after all of this, the voice then turns and comes to the prophet himself and, and there's an invitation made to Isaiah to, to participate. Cry out. I mean, stand up. Take hold of this vision. You know, speak this vision to your people. It's for you. It's for them. I mean, raise your voice. And the prophet does respond, but when he does, the effect is like the biggest, most you know, jarring record scratch that you have ever heard. Cry out, Isaiah calls back. I mean, why am I supposed to cry out? All people are grass. Now, there's a lot that is said with just those few words. Immediately, of course, he is expressing some, well, let's just say hesitancy, uh, about the people of God, about their strength, about their capacity, about their character. I mean, we are talking about the same people here, right? The, the ones who are in exile, right? I mean, cry out to them. Like, they're, they're already in time out. Like, how do you think this is going to pan out? But, you know, in a broader sense, the words from this passage of Isaiah speak to something that is something a little more timeless and, and a little more universal. It speaks to the imperfect and the limited nature of, of creation itself and of the struggle, of the fallibility, of the failures that result from life lived within that. And if we wanted to reflect and to, to think a little bit about our own lives and about uh, the lives that we live in, in the societies that we build, we, we might want to consider how life, no matter how we try to do it and how we organize ourselves, still ends up being subject to these futilities, these failings of our limitations and of the world that we're in. I mean, we could talk about death about decay, about illness, injury. We might want to talk about hate, about greed, about prejudice, about envy. We could talk about war, about violence, about oppression. We could be talking about the lust for power, for significance, and the desire to rule over one another. We could talk about evil. We could talk about sin. We could talk about cruelty. There is nothing that we build in our lives or in our societies that is ever really and, and totally and, I mean, absolutely free of the influence of all of these things. Both our history and our theology testify to the limits of what creation and humanity are, are capable of being and of bearing. Grass withers, the flower fades, as Isaiah puts it. And so his inevitable conclusion, I mean, you know, surely, surely the people are grass. It's just what they are. Isaiah doesn't use a lot of words, does he? But what he says sinks in pretty powerfully. And part of that's because of how true it is. I mean, if you stop for a bit, and if you let the words sink in. Let's get back to Advent for just a second. Advent is often referred to as a penitential season. And 
this is some of what we're getting at when we use that kind of language about it. Uh, we don't just mean by that that in Advent we ought to be repenting you know, of the ways in which we have embraced or, or maybe even colluded with uh, these limitations that we've been talking about in our lives or in the world we're in. I mean, that's part of it, obviously. But, you know, in a larger sense, it's also true to say that Advent is penitential in that it's one of the seasons that gives the fullest voice to the existential struggle of the whole created order. And the yearning that then comes from the heart of that struggle, you know, the yearning that comes from the hearts that we carry within ourselves as well. That yearning for wholeness, for completeness, for, for salvation, for peace, for health, for well-being, you know, for shalom, and not just in sort of the negative sense of the absence of conflict, but I mean in the more positive sense of, you know, things being as they ought to be. To not be trapped anymore by these things that continually damage us and, and then tempt us to be less than what we were created to be. To be free. Advent then offers us a time to be a bit sober about these kinds of things, you know, and to reflect on that yearning that we know comes from our struggles of an imperfect creation, uh, of our imperfect lives, of our imperfect hearts that we carry through what we do and who we are. And I think that's why it's important to point out in our reading today that the prophet's interruption, his response, is not just kind of tossed aside or swept under the rug as though it were some sort of sidelining embarrassment to God's amazing message of victory. Actually, this abrupt-sounding interruption, this left turn, turns out to be a really core component of the message of the whole passage as it stands, as, as it's given to us. Part of the testimony of the prophet to his people and through then the millennia even to us, and to our days, and to our lives. And part of what that communicates to us in our days and in our lives, then, is that the faith that we're called to isn't just some kind of sanitary or abstracted philosophical system. You know, I mean, only good for ivory towers or, you know, people whose lives are just perpetually awesome. I mean, whoever those people are. No. The faith that we are called to turns out to be a full-throated, and a full-bodied participation in God's gift of life, I mean, with all of its blessings and with all of its imperfections, of being cognizant of and present to both. All of the ups, all of the downs. And you know what that means then, is that the faith that we are called to embody and to live in is a faith that is, well, above all, honest. Because it's honest not just about the good, but also about the bad. Now, the thing that I find amazing and, and, and freeing and liberating to discover and to share is that the honesty of our faith ends up paying off because, you know, it is the thing that opens up for us new possibilities and, and opportunities. You know, instead of getting just tossed into the trash for, for derailing the train, as it were, uh, the prophet finds his complaint received and actually honored. You're right comes the response back to him, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, humans are kind of like grass in that sense. It's kind of how they are. And, you know, the world is kind of like a flower that does sometimes, and in some places, wilt. And then, by dint of that exchange, comes this opportunity that we were talking about, doesn't it? A realization comes to the prophet, and this realization reshapes the viewpoint of the prophet, and so the possibilities that he is going to see in front of him, what he thinks that he can be about and what he can do. What you've said is absolutely right, but there's also this. The word of our God will stand forever. So there's more than what you can just immediately see. Now this is where taking time to reflect on our experiences as limited creatures in a limited world ends up moving us forward in our faith. 
you know, it ends up moving us deeper in our faith. Because it creates a chance for us to take stock of things. I mean, really, and honestly, take stock of things. To get a grip on what our struggles are, and on the struggles of the world that we live in. And you know, the thing is, once we've done that, we then are able to make a choice about the kind of person that we want to be in response to the things that we've learned, and to the way in which our viewpoint is being, is being changed, is being transformed. We've got a chance to decide for ourselves who we want to be, I mean, at least in the here and now, in relationship to the invitation of God to live as one of his beloved children in a world that he is very much active and at work in. Now, let's be careful and let's note, none of this is going to make any of us a superhero. I mean, that's not what this is about. And nor will it all by itself just change the whole world in an instant. That's not what it's about either. Isaiah is still Isaiah at the end of our passage, and God's people are, well, pretty much as they are. But that too, I think, is a comfort and an encouragement and an inspiration to us. Because if we throw magic to the side and power fantasies to the side, what we discover is the freeing truth that step by step, day by day, choice by choice, we can truly become more ourselves. The person that God has made us to be in the life and in the circumstances that we inhabit. And in that sense, even within the scope of our own very real limitations, this makes us more free. I mean, freer to move, freer to, to do, to be, to say, you know, freer to dare, maybe even to hope, to have faith, to get up and to give it a shot. Freer to try loving God with everything that we've got and our neighbor without reserve. Freer to trust that God really can and in fact does work in and through us, I mean, plain old human beings as we be. Because this is Isaiah's experience. And being open to the depth of the limitation of human experience in relationship to his God doesn't set him back. It doesn't disqualify him from God's love or purpose or agency. I mean, it's actually rather the opposite. Because he then finds himself reset and regrounded in a faith that is vibrant because it's honest. And it's also representative of the person that he really and truly actually is. Let's wrap up, shall we? My brothers and my sisters, I pray that you would receive the grace of a blessed season of Advent. I encourage you to make time for prayer and for reflection as you're able, and to take the opportunities that come your way for supportive conversation. Christianity has never been a one-man job for you, and you aren't in it alone. I encourage you to take stock of where you are, of where you've been, and of where you think you're going. And I pray most of all that in all that you do, you would find the reward of the mercy and of the faithfulness of God meeting you. Our God who calls to you just in the same voice as he does to the prophet. Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here, here is your God. Amen.